Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hi, hey. thank you for being here. Hi, who said hi? I did, Mirat. Hi, hi, Mirat. <laughs> hi, everyone. <laughs> Mirat is our vice president, Alec, and also programming committee. Chad, she's from Mexico. Hello. Hi, Alec. Nice to meet you. Likewise. <laughs> hi, everyone. We are just going to wait a couple of minutes more to, to start so we, we give people a chance to to come in and uh it's larissa larissa i'm glad to, to see that you were able to come in the the link was sent on the reminder it's on eventbrite and also when you thank you so much lily yeah So maybe in the meantime, uh, you all could tell me where you are connecting from on the chat. I'm curious to see how many people from Vancouver and from other places. I am here in close to downtown Vancouver. Oh, we have Rebecca from, from Victoria. Hola, Arturo. Great to see you. Ladies is from Sven. Mirat is here in downtown Vancouver too. Uh, Angela is in East Vancouver. Naturally, Alec is, is connecting from Mexico. Yeah. Hello, Lily. How are you? Alejandra, is that you? Yes. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Lovely see, it, you. it's happening. We have been preparing that for, <laughs> for quite some time. Yeah. And we are finally finally here. No, I'm, we're very excited to be able to to be you know really to witness this wonderful event that you have planned. So thank you so much for for inviting us. Okay, so I think that we uh, uh, you know people can keep on dropping in, but we have a good group here, and I want to respect uh, everybody's time. So let's let's get this started, and I I would like to. Angela, can you just let people in as they, they come, please? Sure, Lily. Oh, thank, thank, thank you. So, uh, hola, everybody. Buenas tardes. Boa tarde. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Lily Vieira de Carvalho. I'm the executive director of the Vancouver Latin American Cultural Center, VLAC. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are hosting this event from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tisleiwatut nations. I would like to encourage all of you to read and understand the history of this land and the people who have taken care of it for thousands of years and what it means for you to be here. There is a fascinating resource that I'm sharing. Uh, Angela will chat that, share in the, that in the chat. It's called Beyond 94. It's a website that monitors the progress on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's uh, 94 calls to action. VLAC is a nonprofit organization with the mandate of sharing a deeper understanding of Latin American arts and cultures. Our goal is to establish the first cultural center for Latin American arts in Canada, right here in Vancouver. If you still don't know about our organization, uh, please visit our website. The, the link will also go, going to be in the chat. When you registered for this event, we have added your um, email to our newsletter list. And so you're going to receive news about our programming a, a couple of times a, a month. Uh, I, wa I want to also acknowledge the support of the City of Vancouver, the BC Arts Council, Canadian Heritage, and Metro Vancouver to our programs. And also to the Consulate General of Man Mexico, who not only supports our, our programs, but introduced, introduced us to, to Alec Dempster. So we are uh, really, really happy that this is happening. Today's format will be simple. Alec will kick off the conversation and do a little presentation. We will then open the floor to questions and comments from participants. Even if you, during Alec's presentation, if you have any questions, just so you don't miss them, put them on the chat. <clears throat> it's going to be really informal, so we want to, this to be a, a conversation. And, and so whenever you have a, a question, you can unmute, unmute your microphones and raise your, your hand when you have something to say. And the hand can be your hand or the little virtual, <laughs> virtual hand. 
Uh, Alec will be moderating the, the conversation. Uh, Angel and, and I will also be paying uh, attention to the chat just to give you all a chance to speak. This event is being recorded for our archives uh, and will be shared on VLAC's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I will uh, uh, encourage you to put your uh, Zoom on speaker view so you will have a better uh, experience. Now I'd like you to introduce you to Alec Dempster. Uh, Alec is a visual artist, a writer, musician, and folklorist. He was born in Mexico City and grew up in Toronto. After completing studies in music and visual art at Concordia and York University, he spent a decade in the state of Veracruz. His multidisciplinary work includes the two celebrated Loteria games, uh, Jarocha and Huasteca, the Anona music record label created to promote an extensive archive of field recordings, some of them we are going to see today. In interviews with over 40 musicians, dancers and singers and over 100 prints. Alec moved back to Toronto in 2009, where he performed extensively with Café Compan. They recorded their second CD, Nuevos Caminos a Santiago. And in 2013, he published his first book, Loteria Jarocha. Am I saying that right, Alec? You, no, I like your, your pronunciation, a little <laughs> bit of Brazilian. Uh, this is the Loteria Jarocha. Jarocha, Jarocha. <laughs> With it's the poppy pine spill. <laughs> Other books are Loteria Huasteca, La Jarada de Mario, Ca uh, Cartas de del Sotavento, and Ni con Pluma Ni con Letra, Testimonios del Canto Jarocho. His passion for illustrating poetry has led to collaborations with multiple awarded writers. Bienvenido, Alec, over to you. Thank you very much. It's so exciting to finally be in a tertulia with the uh, Vancouver Latin American Cultural Center. I have been um, rehearsing a little bit the last few days, trying to get my thoughts together. There's a lot to talk about. As you mentioned, I spent 10 years really devoted to the music of Veracruz. Um, I did study visual arts and didn't finish my music studies, but I never stopped playing. It was in Veracruz that I found a way to connect all my interests and find new interests to, de to, to develop. So I started to work on projects in Veracruz uh, with Song Jarocho music. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Song Jarocho. Um, for those of you who aren't, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of this music from, from Southern Veracruz. So you know how to place these people you're going to meet. Um, we're going to be talking mostly about the musicians that I interviewed for, for this book, Ni con Pluma Ni con Letra. And before I continue, um, remember that this is a discussion. It's a tertulia, which means we're open to comments, to inquiries. So don't be, um, don't be shy. Um, if I go on, you can interrupt me. I've divided the t talk sort of into sections. So if, if you, in any time, you ask a question, I can pick it up from where I left off. And also, um, in regards to the land acknowledgements that are, are now common in Canada, something that isn't done in Mexico yet. Perhaps it, it will be in the future. Um, where I am now, it's a little bit complicated. Mexico City was the the place of an empire, the Aztec Empire. Um, but where I focused on, um, where we're going to be talking about is Veracruz and Southern Veracruz and the communities that I were in are mostly sort of mestizo communities, but there's a very, very strong indigenous presence in Los Tuxtlas in the region I, I spent most of my time. And those are the Nahuatl people. Um, they speak a variant of Nahuatl people. So, in regards to Song Jarocho music, um, it's associated with this instrument here, the jarana. Now this is really an example of the Spanish influence and when that happened during the, the colonial period in, in, in Mexico. During about two centuries there was a constant ebb and flow of influences coming from Europe via Cadiz and Sevilla 
along the main trade routes that started in Mexico and then ended up going to other parts of South America and passing through Cuba, Havana. So not only was there an influence from Spain of instruments like this, the origin of this instrument is a Baroque, the Baroque guitar. These instruments were sort of adopted throughout the Americas and that's why there's a lot of similarities in instruments you may see in in Joropo music in, in Colombia and Venezuela, um, in Panama, the Mejorana, and this is called the Jarana. So all of these instruments really were reinvented in the Americas. But all of whatever happened in the Americas went back to Europe and was also adopted and there was all kinds of new dances and, and musical forms were adopted by, by com even um, you know, classical composers. Um, in Europe. So this was a, a period of about two centuries in which there was a sort of a common denominator all over the Americas. That's why now there's, you can feel and, and sense the similarity between genres of, of folk music. But in Mexico and, and in Veracruz in particular, um, it was in the 18th century that there was an interest in developing sort of regional and national identities and Song Jarocho is one of these genres that arose out of that. Um, of course, the cities is where there's a lot more effervescence and things are happening quickly and changing. There's, you know, new influences are readily and, and quickly adopted. And where I was, more in the countryside, is where things sort of settled down and didn't change for, for many years, for centuries even. Um, so once Song Jarocho music became established in rural, the rural countryside, I would say since the um, beginning of the 19th century till now, it has really maintained its the repertoire, the, the etiquette in the, in the ceremonies that, in which the music is played. So now um, to, to continue, I'm going to share some slides um, that will involve sharing my screen. So please bear with me. And uh, I will get a better view for everybody. Here we go. How's that? So uh, as you, I showed you the book, this is Ni con Pluma Ni con Letra. And this is a book that was the result of about 10 years of Alex, yeah? sorry to interrupt. I I cannot see the 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 image. Oh, I, I don't know uh, if anybody else, but uh, I just can see the Resume very share. top okay. of yeah. your yeah. We Let's... saw it momentarily, but then it disappeared. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna start again. Something happened. Here we go. Okay, it's great. Okay. Yeah. So here we are, as you can see, Mexico and the state of Veracruz in red. Um, Veracruz is a very long state and you will find different musical genres and the main ones in the north you have Son Huasteco and south of the port of Veracruz you will start to hear Son Jarocho music. That's just a very simplified way to say what is going on, but how do we go to the next one? Oh. Okay, so about three hours south of the Port of Veracruz, this is the town where I, I lived for a year and a half or so. Um, then I moved to the capital of Veracruz, Jalapa. Um, but my comings and goings were constant to, to Santiago Tuxtla. You can see it's still sort of in the middle of the countryside. It's a very, quite a small municipality. I'm having some trouble moving to the next one. Let me see. Ah, here we go. So I mentioned um, how Song Jarocho music sort of became established as a, as a local genre in the countryside. And the most important aspect of Song Jarocho is a, a celebration called a Fandango. 
Um, I'm sure there have been fandangos in Vancouver. There's fandangos in Toronto every once in a while, Montreal. It's a genre that has, a, has had a revival during the past 20 years. As you can see here, there's a wooden platform called the Tarima. And the music that is played at these fandangos are called sones, uh, rather than songs. Sones jarochos. There are sones all over Mexico. And here's a more, a more rural fandango. Uh, and the guy singing his heart out here is Armando Sosa. He is one of the musicians that I interviewed for the book. Um, he was the youngest of the musicians. Let's see if I can find him here. Uh, I'll find him later. Uh, In the meantime, uh, can you repeat the name of the town where you lived for a year? Santiago and Tuxla, Veracruz. Um, the, basically, it's a small municipality with all kinds of rural enclaves. Um, and it's very close to another municipality called San Andres Tuxla. Um, so they, they have some rivalry, but basically you go from one to the other and you're still sort of in the same cultural area. The Tuxlas area is beautiful when you come from the Puerto Veracruz. It's very flat, lots of sugar cane um, growing. Um, there's the big river, the Papaluapan, but then you start to get it up into the hills. And this is an ancient volcanic mountain range and there is still one um, volcano that is active, um, El San Martin. So, fandangos. Um, when will you attend a fandango? When are there fandangos? Um, the fandango can happen for multiple of reasons. You can have weekly fandangos, which I was lucky to sort of attend the last ones that were had been a tradition for a long time on Sunday afternoons in the park of Santiago Tuxla, um, with no special reason, just just to, to get together and play music. But this photograph is a photograph I took at the house of one of my teachers of Song Jarocho in the countryside. And his wife is doing a cleansing ceremony in front of an image of a saint, um, or a virgin, the Virgen de los Remedios. So these are called Delorios. And you can see where the Song Jarocho, was, which is a secular tradition, you don't usually sing about religious themes, can happen at the same time as there, there is a sacred um, event. And so these are called delorios, where the women would be singing litanies, um, prayers to the Virgin, and at the same time there will be a fandango. And this particular image is lent to people, and there's a long list, a waiting list, in order to have, to borrow the, the image of the Virgin. Um, so when I moved to this town, I continued doing my artwork and I um, became sort of a, uh, tried to, to become familiar, so my face would be familiar in the neighborhood, so to speak, and by, I did that by drawing, painting people's homes. And they were quite surprised here that I was interested in their house, which is a, was a more, um, perhaps a poorer home um, made out of wood. There aren't that many of those in town anymore. Now, my big project, once I started learning to play song jarocho music, was to illustrate the whole repertoire of sones. This is what ended up becoming a, a loteria game, which is a type of bingo. Here you can see the, the boards. And at the same time, as I was interviewing people, I was recording musicians. Initially, I was interested in recording my teacher because I wasn't able to pick everything up, you know, during the class. And then when I had a better recorder, I realized that I was actually, it was actually really valuable material um, to document. And this is sort of a, a, a recording session in the shade of a tree um, of a, a family of musicians in Santiago de Tuxla. Um, here is my teacher in the middle, uh, Ildefonso Medel Mendoza. Um, I have a channel on Bandcamp uh, where you can listen to most of the recordings that I've done. And recently we, we um, put up about three hours of music with um, Ildefonso Medel. Um, he's, he's in his 90s now. Unfortunately, he hasn't been able to play for about 10 years. But uh, the proceeds from the sale of that recording go to his family and to him. And here you can see how generations are together. Here we have three generations, but you can't see the, the middle one, which is 
the father of the boy taking, who was taking the picture. Um, the little boy now, he's a, quite a well-known musician. He plays with a group called Mono Blanco. And <clears throat> the portraits that I did for the book um, started with the idea of doing an album cover for one of the CDs. So these are the two musicians you saw in the photograph. Um, <clears throat> and they ended up um, being on the cover of one of the compilations of field recordings I did called Apuro Oído. So good moment for a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. Miref is asking if that drawing of the house was a, a watercolor, and maybe you can tell us the, the technique for this. this work. Yes, uh, watercolor. I did mostly watercolors when I was, you know, wandering around and setting up wherever I fancied. And uh, I haven't done much for a while. I did a lot of watercolor painting, um, even more like surrealistic large pieces. But, uh, and this, this one, is a linoleum print. It's a small print. It's about 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters, as are the ones that you saw um, illustrating the, uh, the Song Harocho repertoire. And here you go. Here are uh, some of the album covers that I did for the uh, field recordings. Some of them were compilations and some of them where you see individual musicians or just sort of trying to document one person's style, repertoire, and there was always an interview as part of that. Remember, yeah, let me know if there are any questions. And then, now we see a map of the region of Santiago Tuxtla, San Andres Tuxtla. Um, you can, Veracruz port isn't on the map, it's a little bit farther, but there's um, towards the corner where there's a little boat, um, Tlacotalpan, which is where the most important festival of Song Harocho happens once a year. But you see there's lots of little little triangles with the names of the places. And these are all the places that the singers that I, that I interviewed mentioned. So it was trying to create a sense of just where the music was happening and where these musicians were, how far they were going. At the time, I mean, we're talking about the 40s, the 50s and the 60s, where these musicians were more active. Um, Many of them, when I actually spoke to them, um, had stopped going to fandangos, had stopped performing. And so I should say that many of them had never performed a concert, had never performed on a stage in the sense of a professional, you know, performance. All of the focus of these musicians' lives has been singing in a fandango. And here we have Salvador Tome. Um, Oh, sorry, let me go back. Um, a picture of him, I found him one day, he was selling some of his, his produce um, on a street in Santiago Tuxla, and uh, I had a harana, so he started to play, play some music for us. He, he passed away last year, and uh, now, now as we look at the portraits, I'm going to read some fragments that I translated into English of the interviews that are, that are in the book. And this is to get you to know these musicians and so that you get a sense of just how broad the panorama of subject matter they broach in the interviews. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second and uh, try to find my notes. Here we go. So Salvador Tome, I got to meet him. Um, several times. That's why I have quite a long interview with him. And he tells us a little bit about the difficulty of learning from your elders. Sometimes the, your parents want you to continue in the tradition and sometimes they do everything for you not to. Um, you'll see what, what I mean. Let me have a bit of tea. As kids, we were at mercy of our parents. My father was a farmer and drank a lot. His work was in vain. He was good at what he did, may his soul rest in peace. But I lost him to his vice. He was a drunkard because he'd get hold of the bottle for two or three months. That's what killed him. He played music, made instruments and sang, but would never let me get near him. Those old timers were, I don't know what, proud or touchy, he would say. If you need to learn, if you like the music, Better be from someone else, not me, son. If he was drinking, don't be looking at me. And when he snapped his finger, 
Make yourself scarce or less, watch out. They were I don't know what, strict or I don't know. Well, yes, Salvador Tome had, had, a, had, had a fascinating life, a very hard life, as many of these musicians um, did as farmers. Um, he also had trouble with his mother, who thought that he, he would, had, someone had put a spell on him or the devil had, had you know, done something. Um, and she ended up burning several of his books of poetry that he would sing. Um, fortunately, all of these musicians, they really rely more on their books than, um, rely on their memory more than the books. Um, let's go back and I'm going to uh, share the screen again. Let's see. I'm having some problems with the, the full screen mode here. Okay. The next musician is uh, Dionisio Vici. Oh. Bear with me, please. Dionisio Vici was a, a staple of the fandangos in Los Tuxlas. He was at all of the Sunday, the Sunday fandangos. Here we go. And he was also someone who actually learned was learned from his parents. His we, father. We, we are having the same problem. Oh, we okay. can see the, the full oh, screen. Okay. Here we go. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So Dionisio Vici was the opposite. Here he is. He is uh, the portrait I did of him. He was able to learn from his parents. They encouraged him, although he sold baskets in order to buy his first harana. And that's why I put this, the pattern of the woven basket in the background. Um, we have um, some videos to share. Um, let's, look, let's watch the first one, which is of Don Salvador singing with Another singer who's still alive, who's also in the book, Feliciano Escribano. It's a short video from YouTube, and if the quality is not so great and you're interested, um, you can probably watch it again later. We'll provide the link. And Feliciano Escribano, I interviewed him, but I never got to hear him sing. Um, it's thanks to some younger musicians in Los Tuxlas that continued sort of the work that I was doing with the singers that I'm, we can hear him sing in this video. I, I can't hear any sound. No, I can't hear it either. Yeah, we tested this before and it was fine. I don't know what's going on now. I think it, it was because I was muted. Let me try again. Mm. If we can't now, uh, I can give it a try from, from mine. Very low. Okay, now we, we got it, sort of. <laughs> Uh, let me give it a try. Okay. Okay. Let me just go. Can you hear it? Yeah, 
Lily, if you'd mute it, we cannot hear you or hear the, the music. You have to unmute yourself. But that's okay. I just want to. I, I muted myself, and with that, I mute the sound. So yeah. that was a was a rookie move. Sorry. But that, we almost saw the whole thing. So <laughs> I just thought it was important for for you to see some of these musicians. When I was doing the interviews and the prints, I didn't have video. So they're in my memory, in my imagination. And then, as, as I said before, some of these people I did interview, but I didn't get to hear them sing. Um, and each musician really has their own style within, within the Song Harocho style. And another really important thing about this book, um, which is called Ni con Pluma Ni con Letra, which would be without a pen or without the written or without uh, letra would be without letters. So without a pen or without letters is a verse from, from, that I got from one of the singers because many of, of them are not necessarily able to write or to read. Um, and even if they do, as I said, the memory is such an important thing. And what I noticed when interviewing these musicians that they each had their own particular repertoire of, of poetry. So they're sort of living libraries of poetry, which some of them, some of it is original, but most of it is passed on, passed on from generation to generation. And what they were singing in that little video, you couldn't hear it very well, but I have the harana here. I'm going to give you a little example. I have some of the verses from the book. Um, they were singing a song called El Busca Pies. And this is one of the songs where there isn't a theme, which allows two musicians to get together, or more, two singers. Um, nowadays, people play, sing, dance, they do it all. But in the past, it was more specialized. So you might have someone that would come to a fandango just with a voice. and get up to sing and some musicians are not so interested in the dialogue with another musician, with another singer, but the ones that I did, most of them have stories about these encounters which were sometimes duels between musicians. And they were playing this song, El Busca Pies. <laughs> very short harmonic pattern that's repeated over and over again and you just jump in and sing. There are other songs in Song Harocho where one person sings part of the verse and then someone else will repeat. But this song is one person goes and then the other one. So I'm just going to sing a couple of verses. Canto 
so the interesting thing about a song like oh. that is that uh, there's no knowing how long it will go on for, particularly if there's a few singers and they start to get into a dialogue. Um, you will see um, there's a little video I made. I w maybe we can find Before that one. Before we it's go on, on that, um, uh, let me just uh, pass on a couple. First, thank you so much for playing and singing. <laughs> that, that, that was fabulous. Uh, so Rebecca is asking if the song, song is share a common time signature. Well, yes, actually, there are groups of songs which you could group into one time signature and then there's others. So most of them are, you would, you would call it a 6-8 time signature, but the syncopation, it has like a 3-4 or 6-8. Larissa know? has a question too. Yeah. So thank you so much, Alec, for, for ah. playing for us. Uh, this is actually the first time that I get in touch with Harucho, oh. uh, but it really reminds me of a, a song from Natalia La Furcade. You probably know it, Mi Tierra Veracruzana. Ah. Yes. I just wanted to ask you if this is also Harucho and what's your opinion about pop artists that are trying to make this genre more popular? If you have any other references, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, I've seen, I've seen the video a few times and she has another really good video, Natalia La Furcade which is like 20 minutes or 25 minutes long. Um, I don't know if she sings that particular song, but she sings with all kinds of other musicians from Veracruz, Song Harochu musicians and jazz musicians. Um, I'll see if I, I can find it and uh, I'll send it to you. But uh, as far as there's a lot of influence because Song Harocho has become quite popular and not just Song Harocho. Um, I'm happy to say that um, folk music in Mexico in general is becoming more accepted. It's not as mainstream as in some countries, like in Brazil, I think there's like more, more of an audience for local forms, but uh, even, um, I think Café Tacuba did another one, no? Ojalá que llueva café with a Huasteco violin. So there's a lot of examples and even other, in other countries, people drawing on Son Jarocho. So Lee just Pound a couple, yeah, so, to, sorry. you know, just to mention another person that had done some song Harucho. Uh, so Tanya said, I had to pick up my daughter from school, but I'm sorry, I'm kind of late, but I just want to tell uh -huh. Alec that I met him in Mexico many years ago in Tala uh -huh. Taupan and Jalapa. I'm really glad to see you here. Thank you and thank you to hear my people music. Café con pan, café con pan. <laughs> That's and, uh, Café con pan is, uh, they use that to teach the dance. Café con pan, café con pan. <laughs> Which is the name of your of your group too, right? I had, yeah, I was yeah. in Toronto, yeah. And so I have a question because what I'm seeing is that it's such an important work you've done with the interviews and, and collecting all these uh, field recordings and, you know, in the, in the tradition of like Alan Lomax. And, and, uh, and so uh, what I was wondering because Alan Lomax did so much for Americana and for you know uh, uh, music in the United States, but it was a uh, work that was funded by by the government, which, which was interested in that in the the time. So uh, I I'm curious to know if you had any support to to do that kind of work. Uh, well, Alan Lomax, I just someone just gave me his uh, the biography, which is about six hundred pages. He also did a lot of work in the Caribbean and in Europe too. Um, I did not know that. Yeah. Yes, his recordings in Portugal are, and Spain are just and Italy are gorgeous. Um, not to mention all the stuff in, in the Caribbean. But anyway, um, no, mostly I have not received um, financial assistance from the government for these projects. Um, it would be great, but uh, no, I've managed to to do it on my own, so to speak. There have been a few occasions in which we've had some help to produce the CDs, like just to, to get them made, but not for the, the actual sort of the, the actual work, so to or speak. Or the field work. Oh. No, never, never. Um, yeah, I know the, there's one, the one recording um, where you saw the family with a microphone at the beginning, um, there's some grants to assist sort of community projects and uh, they got, I wrote a grant for them to, to be able to make the CD, but it would, didn't pay the actual, actual recording. Or, I see. You know. 
because you're you're mentioning uh, that one of the singers died recently, and then we, we you you know that if you don't do that, you know that that dies with them. Um, much of that the if they don't don't write down, if there is no recording. It, exactly, um, I think that's something that you realize after you know after they're gone sometimes. I, yeah. I think I, you start, I started to realize that with my grandparents, because my grandparents uh, were quite good storytellers. And I did not, uh, I never recorded my grandmother, but my grandfather I did right at the very end. Um, but it wasn't, we should have done it before. I think so these things you can do at home, you know, you don't have to go to the, to the cruise <laughs> to do uh, oral history. And now Rebecca is asking if that wooden platform was it so they can dance on it, and if yes. and if they dance in pairs or solo. Yes, the tarima. Um, there's different kinds of tarimas depending on the style of, of, of music in in Mexico, but these are really fairly simple. Um, even I've heard of stories of in the countryside of people sort of unscrewing the door from the house the wooden door and putting it on the floor and, and using it as a tarima. <laughs> so they're, they're not that big. So some of the songs are danced in couples. So you don't need a lot of space, but the songs, the bulk of the repertoire are actually songs danced by women only. And they dance sort of facing each other, but there could be two, four, six, eight women at the same time dancing. So you need a bit of a bigger platform Angela has a question. Oh, Alec, um, I, I'm just curious about the way to approach the mu like the musicians. Like, how do you build that relations with them that they agree to be recorded to like somehow pass that uh, knowledge and like do they see you like an outsider in a way? How, like, how to to build that relation with them? Oh, I, I'm seen as an outsider anywhere in Mexico. Even though I was born in Mexico City, uh, even people that have they've heard, they know that i was born here but they kind of forget and they someone will ask oh alec he yeah he he's canadian but he yeah uh, you know but anyway um as far as the musicians it really depends on the on each person but the best thing is when you're already kind of familiar to somebody like if i was at the fandangos on sundays every sunday for weeks and then one day i said oh how about if we get together and you tell me a little bit about your life Okay, he froze for us, right? Oh. And then, oh. Oh, you froze just for a oh. second. Yeah. So it's also, oh. Is that better? Yeah, I think you're a tiny bit out of sync. And we also, we also have a question when you're done with your thought. Okay, so it's also explaining what's going to happen with the material. It's not like, oh, let's just have a talk and I'm going to record you. It's like, okay, I'm going to give you a copy of the interview or I'm going to do a portrait of you and I'm going to give you your, the print um, or we're going to record and you're going to get CDs or we're going to sell them in Tlacotalpan. Or, so it's sort of trying to explain why, you know, and what, what, what they're going to get from it as well. And a question from Dana. Hi, I first wants to thank you for all the research that you have been doing through the years because as it was mentioned before these uh, people they just die and all the knowledge also die with them and nobody really pay attention or put time and energy and love to, to record uh, I'm originally from Cuba so I'm curious to know if in part of your research you have been uh, working on similarities between the son cubano and the son jarocho because the son jarocho looks pretty similar for me to something that we have in cuba but more in the central part that is called um Punto. repentismo uh -huh. because they, they have repentismo in too in brazil and, we, and, and i was <laughs> <laughs> we also have a repente, it's called. Uh -huh. But uh, again, I'm just curious to know if there is any similarities between uh, the Son Cubano and the Son Jarocho. Thank you, Alec. Um, yeah, so just a quick note about things dying with people, you know, with, with, their pass with their passing, with the whole amount of knowledge dying. 
I think it's not necessary, it doesn't necessarily happen because these musicians are singing what they learned from people that passed away that weren't recorded. Um, I think it happens when there's some kind of generation gap, when there's a rupture, but anyway. Um, as far as the Cuban, there's a lot of connection between Cuba and Veracruz, but mostly through the port of Veracruz. If you go to Veracruz, but people feel like there's some kind of sense of, of Havana as well. And instruments arrive through, and genres arrive through the port of Veracruz and stayed in the port like Danzon. But in the countryside, there are some forms like um, the Punto Cubano is what they use to improvise, the repentistas. And uh, there's a similar style um, or accompaniment, which is uh, a jarabe, which they use to, to recite decimas. So that's, I think if you go to Veracruz you'll, and hear that, and then you go to Cuba and hear people improvising, you'll, you'll, you'll feel the connection. And I went to an event where there were improvisers from all over Latin America, and each country has their own musical form to accompany the decima, which is this form, this poetry that I just recited. Um, but they're all connected, and at those events you'll have somebody from Cuba improvising with the Chileans, and then somebody from Panama will be singing the Mexican f version, so they can jump from one to the other, with some effort, of course. So I have a couple of comments. Uh, uh, Rebecca was suggesting that we should ask questions to you that you can only answer by playing music. So. <laughs> And Gabi is saying that, so interesting, the lithographs. I remember the Chilean carver, Santos Chavez. He worked from our tradition too. Uh -huh. Santos Chavez, if you want I'm to look that up. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you want to show us a couple more clips. So let, let's go to I'd them. like to see the clip where, where I wrote the, verse, the letters to the verses. I transcribed the translation. Is Start there... with black, the one that's in black. It's basically a, 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 a music that I recorded, and then uh, uh, I put some text frames in there. Let me see if if. Yes, yes. Uno que sea de confianza y 
que por nosotros vea. As the, um, that goes on and on, um, but I thought it would be a good example of, of a, the poetic dialogue in which they choose to use a certain kind of, uh, they use a theme of sort of romantic poetry, um, but they could have tried, gotten into a more of an aggressive dialogue. Um, but I, I guess they don't, they don't use, I've, n I've never really heard singers to use those kind of verses where they actually provoke each other um, negatively. But they, they tell, told me about that for sure. Um, and I, I, I was going to read a little bit of an interview with um, Dionisio. Ah, and this is uh, more about what can happen when two singers have a dispute in a fandango. And he said the following. I went to the Tres Zapotes, a St. Anthony celebration, and dueled with an older singer. His name was Alejo Comi. Fantastic, a great singer. So I started singing. I only have a few verses, but I have verses to defend myself because he's provoking me. Respond to his verses. Because if a singer is insulting you and doesn't have verses to respond to yours, that is where you get the upper hand. That's where it's about being good. He's coming back at you at your verses and you must respond. You respond the best you can. Without a doubt, that's where you're winning him over. And if he doesn't respond to your verses, he starts falling behind. And you push hard on him until you may have some verses to provoke him and finish him off once and for all. The man, as soon as he hears a verse he can't answer, he doesn't respond to me or sings me a provocative verse, but I respond. That is where I'm winning. So he starts to stumble. He walks off, because that's what happened with Alejo Comi. A local guy told him, the Tuxteco, he's going to screw you, he's going to beat you. I've heard him sing before. Well, that's what I want. Well, that's um, the beginning of the story. Dionisio Vici ended up with a bullet through his shoulder. But you need to read the book to hear the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and when his mother, when he fa he's, he's, when his mother saw him being brought in a hammock between two people on a stick, she said, "Oh, I don't, I don't want to see my son. I had his breakfast ready for him and everything." And she was just so upset, you know, that he had gotten into trouble. But luckily, he survived to tell the tale. So then, I was asking, where where can we buy the books? Are they available for us here in Canada? Uh, there, no, I would have to send it from Mexico, but uh, that's not a problem. Okay, so we'll just point people to you. Yeah. Okay. And there is, um, there's another, there's one woman that I interviewed in, in the book, I think before we run out of time. Um, it's important to mention her. Um, there were some women that would sing in the fandangos, and it was one question that I would always ask. Um, so who was singing? And some would say, well, yeah, but she wasn't that great. Or one would say, yeah, but she got married and now she's, they don't, you know, her husband won't let her play at the, sing at the Fandango. So that was 20 years ago. Now everything's changed completely. Um, women have taken a primordial role in Song Harocho, um, contemporary Song Harocho. Um, usually they were just the, mostly dancers in Song Harocho. But the woman I interviewed was the daughter of a poet who sold poetry to the, many of these singers 
And another thing that's important to mention is that um, her and her father spoke Nahuatl. Um, I didn't meet a lot of people in the area, particular musicians who, who spoke Nahuatl. Um, the language has been lost in a lot of communities um, over one or two generations. So this is what um, she says about her father. And she was the one that wrote down a lot of his verses in, book, in, a, in books. Intelligence is a must. The brain is a lot of little balls at work, on the spot. Put the word in place. That's the key. But in a wampango, someone arrives and sings, then someone else responds. Like an argument, no? Those provocative verses. The poet is born, not made. Now they study poetry. In order to compose, they study poetry. They used to say to my father, you have the devil's staff because you answer immediately. He said, don't bother me with savagery. Look for the motif in your own head. That's why you have it. And that's it. Think for yourself when you sleep, when you are alone, meditate, and you'll see the words are born and you put them down. For example, you're watching television, all the nonsense that is being born. Can you come up with a verse? You get it there. I say now that words are different, but you must search, like you, who comes from abroad, in search of another word, another idea, and you find it. So some That's wisdom, great. some wisdom from Berta Llanos. Uh, Rebecca is asking if, uh, if there are any women uh, harana players. Oh, the countless number of harana, requinto, leona, marimbol. I mean, these are different instruments in, in Son Jarocho. Um, recently, there's more. There was a, actually a festival of, of women uh, song harocho players in Veracruz. There's okay. several groups of, of just women, and then a lot of groups of men and women play together. We are getting close to our time. Is there anything else that you you would like to show us uh, before we wrap up, Alec? Uh, I I think that you've seen enough. I think. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've, well, I, I guess you gave us a taste of the whole thing. We're definitely going to have you again too, you know, to delve in, into one other aspect of, of, of this whole culture, plus uh, in your own work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Mari Ken is asking if you can come and do a concert here. Uh, sure. I, I actually have some friends that could join me. And, and uh, you know, Tom Landa, he's a Vancouver based musician. He plays Song Harucho. Let's make that happen then. <laughs> so I'm going to thank uh, Alec uh, uh, most of all and, and everybody who's here thank you so much it really this is a free uh, event but you know showing up it's a great way of, of supporting the, the work we do and we want to thank Alec for sharing his time and, and expertise this afternoon wow. the video record of this event will be available at Black's YouTube channel in, in, in a couple of weeks uh, Angela will put the the link of the uh, recording on the chat. There you can also see previous tertulias and, and other VLAC events. And our next event will be an in-person talk this Friday, May 20th. And, and that is going to be a really interesting conversation about visual arts in Latin America with uh, music and art in politics in Latin America with Professor Jairo Salazar. So that's in person at Britannia Community Center this Friday. Angela put the, the, the link on the chat that there, there is the, the full information there. It's another free event. We are going to be serving tea and cookies. So, so come to, to spend some time with us on Friday. And if you would like to keep uh, events like this available to all, uh, you can always consider donating any amount, even if small. Plax is a charitable nonprofit organization and donations are always welcome. The link for donations is on, on the chat. Uh, and one last favor, we have a two minute survey that we would like you to answer. It will help us know if this event format is the best for you and, and it can share any, any comments you have. We are setting, we are putting the link on the chat, but if you miss that, we are also going to send the link to you through Eventbrite. So thank you again to the Consulate of Mexico. Thank you so much, Alec, for being with us today. Yeah. I, I had a great time. I bet that everybody had too and learned some, so much from, from you.
So that's it for today. I'm going to turn off my, my camera, but we are going to keep the event open for just a few minutes more in case you want to click on any of the, of the links we have shared. And th a quick thanks to Alejandra at the Mexican consulate for, for putting us in touch. Yeah, thank you, Alejandra, for making this happen, for putting us in touch. It's, it's really much appreciated. Muchas gracias. Thank you all. Bye, Alex. No. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Gracias. Bye. We're already getting uh, a, a survey responses. <laughs> Thank you. And we are going to share share that with you, um, Alec. The result of the of the survey. And Diana is asking if Tom Landa and the Paper Boys, <laughs> is it Tom Landa? Yes. Tom Landa from the Paper Boys. Angela uh, is telling you to all to, to, to follow us on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to share Alex's um, website and I even prepared a slide for that, but it's super easy to find. If you Google Alec Dempster, that's the first, uh, the first result. Also, um, yeah, I'm going to put in uh, Bandcamp, my Bandcamp. I, I did that when you, okay. uh, it's a okay. Bandcamp, Alec Dempster, right? I shared I, that no, while you were mentioning. It's Anona Music. Anona. I, and so I don't have that then. I put one that was, that I found that it was well, Alec Dempster. Maybe it works too, but um, yeah, Anona. Good, that was, I enjoyed that. It went by quickly. It was so interesting. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, so interesting. You know, Alec, we in Colombia we have that respond thing in songs with Vallenato. Oh, okay. Like they do in the festival, like Festival Vallenato, they do that thing about responding. And it's all like mm -hmm. bad thing to each other, and they just like keep <laughs> in mind. And they do also that with Trova, which is like oh a very traditional it's with the guitar but they they try to just like beat each other to see if they're able to respond right away I, i've seen some videos and uh, they're very fast yeah they're very fast like you, you you have no time to think you just have to have the words in your head as you said yeah. you just like go with that so interesting and there's a there's a tradition in mexico and they have a two stages with a a poet on each side and his musicians and it starts at midnight and it goes till sunrise so that's like a duel really yes yeah. It's, yeah. but it's uh has a whole structure they have to start on certain themes and develop them and then the very end is when they just tell each other that they're just you know <laughs> yeah okay, i'm stopping the recording now okay okay